you know, reach out absolutely. to me. Absolutely. I um how to get in touch with me, get you know, get in touch with NBJ and we'll take a look at what you've done. And then, you know, I think we can talk offline, uh, you know, about how to reach uh, how to reach a broader audience. I mean, Great. If you just I I absolutely, I absolutely welcome any feedback. What we've typically done is we've put it out to our email list and our social media, and that's not that's not enough. And Man. so, um, and that's why, and that's why I'm here today, and that's why I'm asking for help. So, um, like I said, I'll put my um, I'll put my email and my um, my phone number in the chat and I really look forward to meeting some of you and talking with some of you. All right, thanks Ron, Robin, I appreciate that. We appreciate that. Uh, all right, now we wanna to go to the main event which is uh, about our Pulitzer winners. And uh, we want to um, congratulate them all uh, and, and be happy that they're with us. Uh, I wanna start off with the Pulitzer for uh, breaking news because uh, Monica has to leave early. And the, uh, what, the, what was the citation? The citation said that this, this went to the staff of the Miami Herald for its urgent yet sweeping coverage of the collapse of the Champlain Tower South condominium complex, merging clear and compassionate writing with comprehensive news and accountability reporting. So I wanna ask uh, Monica uh, and also to uh, all the other winners if they could uh, just give us about three to five minutes on uh, what it is they did, how they did it, and uh, what can the rest of us learn from, uh, from how they conducted themselves and managed to win this prize. So uh, Monica, please uh, take the floor. Thank you, Richard, and uh, thank you to everyone. I wanna also congratulate the other winners that are on the call. Um, this was quite, um, a journey for me personally and professionally. I am in month 14 here in Miami. And so to get a Pulitzer and um, my first, I've been a finalist before, but it was my first Pulitzer and my first year as the editor at the Herald. So um, really an amazing journey, but obviously a team effort. I was really excited to see that um, it was a staff award. It obviously comes with a mix of sadness and gratitude. Surfside was a horrific tragedy that none of us wants to experience. Um, that's part of, I think, the reason uh, the Herald has performed so well in covering the stories. Um, and if I were giving tips, I would say there are a number of things that we did pretty strategically early on. Um, the first thing that we did was that we separated the coverage into some very specific lanes. So we had our day-to-day -day breaking news, we also pretty immediately identified um, victims, um, mm -hmm. someone who would be responsible for the victims. And then we obviously jumped uh, really the night that day on investigative coverage. So the, those three things together gave us clear direction on, on how our coverage would happen. And I started telling uh, my leadership team and the leaders and I worked together. Um, many of you know Rick Hirsch, who was the managing editor now retired at the time. And we said um, at about five o'clock that morning that this wasn't, first of all, this was our story, right? This was our local story to tell. And so we wanted to um, take that as a responsibility and ownership that uh, this was a local story. We knew that there was going to be a tremendous amount of national media um, and, and more in our, in our backyard, if you will. Uh, but we took it on as our local story, our community story. We had reporters who lived walking distance from that condominium. Um, we had reporters who took their bikes and their scooters to uh, provide some pretty amazing coverage. So having those three lanes was uh, gave us real clear direction. And we knew that night that this story was going to be with us for many years to come. And we treated it that way. Um, one of the things we did early on was hired an engineer, an independent engineer. We did interviews for an engineer and really wanted to make sure that we had someone from outside of Florida who could uh, fact check us, right? And make sure that we were holding that piece of accountability um, high, high above everything that we did. So that we, we won the uh, Pulitzer for breaking news, obviously, but as a part of that, the investigative coverage was already in that breaking news within the first seven within the first 48 hours really, but within, definitely within the first seven days. Um, the other thing I wanna point out is that we did, we also um, 
put together a running timeline, if you will. I, uh, I should have shared this with you, Richard, to be able to show. I, I'm happy to, to share my screen if you want to see it. But one of the pieces of our entry was actually a timeline that described how we covered the story. And I am um, almost convinced that that was played a real role in um, the package itself and the pulling together of the package in a way that presented it to um, the jurors to make it really clear about the work we had done. And so that timeline starts um, just before two in the morning. And then it almost gives a minute by minute, like 10 to 15 minute window um, of the day and how it unfolded with images of the reporters involved, with um, tweet embeds, uh, visuals, it really kind of captured and it went almost minute by minute um, on June 24th, the entire day. And it culminated with um, a piece of a column that I wrote that talked about how this was our community and we were gonna treat it like um, we were protecting and taking care of our own family. So um, those are some of the things that we did uh, that I think proved really significant and that still continue to have an impact in our coverage today. Um, it has been an incredible story when, when we, like I said, a real, really mix of, of sadness and gratitude for those who have gotten the award in the space of tragedy. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we reflected the sensitivity in our coverage uh, and how we went about reporting the story that was really, really important. When it was announced and when I met with my team, the first thing we did was have 98 seconds um, of a, a silence. Um, and that was in, in recognition of and memorial for the 98 victims of that tragedy. So really, you know, I think what this Pulitzer showed is the power of local journalism, the impact of local journalism and how important it still is um, for that to be play a role in the news in, that we're providing. Thank you, Monica. I also point out that Marjorie Miller is here. She's the Pulitzer administrator. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to, to let people know that she's here as, as well as Kevin Merida, one of the board members. Now we do have time for maybe a couple of questions from Monica, uh, if anyone has them. I have one. Okay. Is that okay? Yes, yes. Um, so I thought one of the most amazing pieces of this just so impressive package was the one about the inspector who only two days before had taken the pictures and you basically said, wow, this is a disaster waiting to happen. Not knowing, of course, it was only 48 hours away. Can you say right. a little bit about how you got that story? Cause I was just blown away by that. Yeah, we started uh, requesting information on the building. I should say it was a case where um, information started coming to us pretty quickly and pretty um, steadily in terms of understanding how that big uh, building was constructed. Um, yeah, we, I've got to be in a meeting though. We knew right away um, that there had been some serious problems in um, the, the work that went into the building. Um, obviously there's a 40 year um, inspection process that most of those condominiums go through. So we got those records really, really quickly and started to look at them. Um, you know, Sarah Blasky and the uh, investigative team for the Miami Herald really, and when, I, when I talked about those, setting up those lanes of coverage early on, the I team started that process that day, looking at how that building, uh, the history of that building and how it had come about. Even, you know, as of last week, we we're still reporting on um, things that were happening everything from the fire alarm that going off. We had the person at the uh, fire alarm company basically say F you when the reporter called him, um, literally. And so that story came together one of many to, um, based on the records that we had gotten on the building, essentially. And so having people dedicated to doing just that, figuring out what had happened as a way to accountable, make sure it didn't happen again, started that day and that week within the first week. So it really came together from um, some pretty tremendous record gathering um, and dogged, really dogged approach to getting the information. And then um, talk about fact checking, man, um, you know, the, the amount of work we, that went into, which is what led us to getting an independent engineer, the amount of work that we had to put into making sure that all the visuals we were seeing, one of the first key pieces that led to that, if you remember, um, 
there was that build, there was that uh, video that showed the building falling. And so we kind of broke that video down to see where the fall had begun because there were all kinds of theories, right? There was sand, there was um, work being done nearby. Um, it was all kinds of theories that started with the pool, people said, right? And so looking at the columns, um, that's what we're, the story we're talking about, looking at the columns themselves of the um, building um, became a key part in our continuing investigation. So really, I would say the answer to that is by some pretty dogged um, work and looking at the construct of that building. And now, you know, I think any condo really and um, along the along that seashore. Very good. All right. Anybody else? One one last question for Monica. No? Okay, very good. Thank you. I'll, I'll be on for a bit longer. Oh good. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Now a question for Kevin, Kevin Merida, and that is that when we announced um, this uh, these awards, um, uh, people some people were very impressed by the diversity among the, um, the, uh, the winners and the finalists as well. Uh, uh, can you address that for a minute about if, whether that was just an accident or uh, intentional? Well, look, I mean, you know, work speaks for itself. I mean, part of, um, it's also, I think this year, the juries, the, the, the window onto the work, right? Because that's where the process starts. You know, first of all, I mean, you 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 get entered by your news organization. You obviously other you you can enter individually yourself, but the juries, the selectors. I mean, it's I believe is the most diverse jury um, pools, plural that we've that we've ever had. You know, and and I think there there certainly is a a commitment. You know, to the the Pulitzer board is always looking at at diversity and in all the ways that that manifests itself. So, but but the work is excellent, you know. It, and there's um, there's always tremendous work in um, when we're looking at the the prizes, you know. So, uh, it you you always feel good when there's diverse uh, a diverse collection of winners, and that diversity is uh, just diversity of experience, you know. Uh, there was an astrophysicist that was, uh, you know, won uh, Quantum Magazine. You know, there, there's a, you know, a uh, Winbert, Winford Rembert one uh, who had spent uh, his time in prison and learned leather car things in, in prison for memoir. So you're always happy with diverse experience um, in journalism and arts and letters. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I think when you have diverse pool of of um people looking at the work you're probably going to get uh, a wider um consideration of the work you're here okay thank you uh, i want to move on now to uh, uh national reporting uh because some people have to leave early there as well uh so uh for national reporting we have let me make sure i want to read this thing properly uh from the staff of the new york times uh at, for, uh, for an ambitious project that quantified a disturbing pattern of fatal traffic stops by police, illustrating how hundreds of deaths could have been avoided and how officers typically avoided punishment. All right, so we have uh, Kim and Michael here, Kim Barker and, and, and Michael here from the New York Times who worked on that piece and uh, take it away. What did you, uh, how did you win that Pulitzer and what advice do you have for the rest of us? I mean, you'd have to ask the uh, jury uh, about like how we were gonna. <laughs> okay. um, well, what was I the mean, work I mean, that, 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 that impressed the jury? Let's put that one. Totally, totally. Um, first of all, thanks very much for having us here today. It's, it's an honor to be on this panel and on this discussion, which was such a diverse and you know, talented group of people. Um, so we went into this project last year uh, with a question and it was a question from our editor, Dean Bacay, um, you know, and, to be honest, rarely do good ideas come from editors. I think every <laughs> reporter on, on, the, on this would, would agree with that. Um, but he had the question after um, Dante Wright was killed, like how come these traffic stops keep turning deadly? So this has obviously been something that's been in the news a lot in recent years, right? And 
Um, what I really loved about the project is that we went out of our way to credit the folks who had done this kind of work before us. We credited the Washington Post, Fatal Encounters, you know, um, these different uh, mapping police violence, these different groups that had really made this a priority. And we, we relied on their da data because it wasn't like we wanted to reinvent the wheel. And so we started off with, okay, how many people were technically unarmed, that is not wielding a gun or a knife and, 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 and killed at traffic stops? And how did that happen? So I'm gonna share a screen right now and I promise I'm not gonna bore you too much with data, but I, I just wanna get at the idea of the sort of work we were doing. Um, let me see. Let's see if this actually works. This might not work. So I'm not going to belabor this. Oh, point. Maybe Benita can help you, Benita Bing. Um, yeah, so Kim, if you could just bring up whatever the information is that you want to share on your screen first. Yeah, it's just and it's then, not, my, my location. It's a new computer and my location service. It's not allowing me to do it. And I don't want to waste a lot of time. OK, I know no problem. 90 right now. But um, trust me, this. Uh, this this um, database that we or this spreadsheet that we created, it turned into this thing where, you know, there were all these different it was shared on Google Docs and we all were doing different cases and basically going along and categorizing things. Was the person in a moving vehicle? Was the person, you know, what was the race of the of the individual? Was it a sheriff's office or a police department that that, that where this happened? Was there a lawsuit? What was the result of the lawsuit? And so this spreadsheet grew and grew and then video investigation, visual investigations got involved and they were looking for cases that illustrate, illustrated in particular officer created jeopardy. When an officer jumps in front of a car thinking um, that this will stop the vehicle and how that creates the jeopardy that, that the officer then resolves by shooting and then you know obviously gets off because says that they fear for his or her life, right? So we were we were doing this and really trying to quantify, you know, the number of deaths and what we came up with was more than four, 400 avoidable deaths of what we determined were avoidable deaths at traffic stops over a five year period. And like with each one of these deaths, we then were doing public records requests and we're trying to like, you know, get the video, get the video, get the documents, get like whether the police officer faced any discipline. And this was obviously very difficult to do. Um, and we ended up with that, with stories like looking at how officers, these, un, these avoidable deaths, how officers um, have impunity for these deaths and then doing a separate story on a man by the name of Cedric Mifflin, um, a young black man who like so many other of these cases was killed when he tried to flee a traffic stop that was that looked to be very pretextual. He was being pulled over for playing loud music in Phoenix City, Alabama. And so the goal of that story was to really go deep narrative and tell the story of one particular human being that this happened to, and also just show how shooting at moving vehicles is a practice that has been banned in many departments for a number of years and how, you know, and the fallout from not like listening to these sort of bans. And in that particular case, we ended up actually, we couldn't get the body cam. So we ended up finding a forensic expert who agreed to recreate it for us based on the fact that I had found the car that this happened in. And so was, was able to take close-ups of all the bullets and the angles going into the vehicle and that we got um, the report from the state investigators from, from his mom. But it was, it was very difficult. Alabama doesn't like to release results. And um, I'm gonna let my colleague, Michael Keller, who's on here talk about the other parts of this series that we did um, so that I'm not uh, hogging all the speaking time. Okay, go Michael. Sure, I just wanna echo what Kim said. Thanks to everyone for, uh, for listening and for uh, bringing us here. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I think one of the challenges when you get, you know, this big question that we got from Dean of, you know, traffic stops um, is kind of how do you figure out the lanes that, that your reporting uh, goes in? Um, and so the, the quantification part was one. Um, I worked on another aspect of it, uh, which was trying to figure out, you know, what is the, the demand for these stops and the revenue focus, which I think was fairly well covered um, in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, but my colleague, Mike McIntyre, was looking into the case of uh, an Army lieutenant, uh, Karen Nazario, a Black and Hispanic lieutenant in uh, Windsor, Virginia, who you may have 
scene was pepper sprayed, the video went viral, and he was digging into just what was going on in that town and found that, you know, the mayor was making demands for more stops, even in the days after that incident, saying, hey, revenue's down for this year. Um, and we found some other emails that pointed to uh, specific federal grant money being tied to the amount of stops that were being made. So they said you, during grant time where you know, specific shifts that are being funded by uh, NHTSA, a uh, federal agency, um, you have to make a certain number of stops per hour or we're gonna lose our grant money. So it pointed to um, you know, this being just a much larger issue. I think it's obviously something that you, know, you all, you know, everyone kind of knows happens, but we thought, how can we really put some firm and solid data reporting behind it? Um, I think one of those, you know, again, it's a big question. It's kind of, you can probably pick any town and tell that story. So let me, I'll, I'll try if this isn't, is this isn't folly, I'll try and share my screen here. Um, we built this, oh, yeah. this data tool. Does this work here? Great. Um, we got some census data and it turns out every five years, the census does a survey of local municipalities and you can get some pretty good insight into where they get their money from. And one of those is the amount of fines and fees um, that they get. And so it took a little, the, it's not the easiest data to work with, um, but we're able to calculate the uh, percentage that they get from fines and fees from their total budget. And this map here shows all the towns that get more than 10% of their of their total of their revenue from fines and fees, and it was interesting. You know, you see this really clear geographical pattern. Uh, you know, predominantly in the south, and we found that these are places where it's really hard for local municipalities to raise revenue. They're either statutorily limited; they can't raise taxes. Uh, in some places, you have to have a referendum, a voter-approved referendum, if you want to raise any tax revenue. Uh, it makes it very difficult, or people are just not inclined ideologically to pay taxes. And so there's, there's lower tax rates there, um, but places still need money. And so it's much more politically palatable to ticket people passing through. Um, and it's, you know, you can kind of turn on the spigot, turn off the spigot if you need more money in a given uh, time period. What this tool let us do though, you know, you have the whole country, we've narrowed it down to regions. We were able to kind of filter um, and find the towns that were, you know, really on the higher end uh, of this revenue and so this is now kind of 70% or so. And, you know, you kind of zoom in. And what we did was we found, you know, like in Oklahoma here, you see there's a number of towns just along one highway. Um, and so I ended up traveling to Oklahoma. Um, my co-reporter, Mike McIntyre, traveled to Ohio and visited some towns there. Um, and that kind of let us focus the story and tell something that, uh, you know, was kind of national in scope, but also with the detail of what's happening in these places. Uh, one of the towns that I visited in Oklahoma said, you know, we, we do this because they, a town of less than 800 people and they get over a million dollars in revenue from traffic fines. Uh, they said, we do this purely for, for drunk driving enforcement for traffic safety purposes, which, you know, I think everyone's pro traffic safety. I, you know, I'm pro traffic safety. Um, I was able to find someone who was ticketed for driving drunk. They were above the legal limit but they only got uh, a ticket for public intoxication and reckless driving, which was very curious. Um, and it turns out in Oklahoma, um, when a municipality, uh, according to a recent law, municipalities have to give DUI cases to the district court. They can't deal with it locally. And this was a law that was put in to avoid people hiding their record. So if you got a DUI in multiple little districts, no one would be able to connect the dots and you wouldn't be able to find repeat offenders. Um, but that meant that DUI cases then generated no money for these local towns. Um, and I asked the chief about this and said, hey, this is kind of strange. You say you're doing DUI enforcement. This guy was able to pay $2,000 and then got his truck back the next day, didn't lose his license, didn't do anything. Um, and it's one of these moments where you think, you know, you obviously go and you get comment from everybody. Um, and we thought, you know, what, what are they going to say that this seems like pretty damning evidence? Maybe they're going to come up with some technicality. And the chief then said, yeah, we don't do DUIs anymore, actually. Um, you know, the district attorney doesn't take our cases. Uh, and, you know, we don't even really do any kind of DUI enforcement, but we still are trying to make this argument that it's about keeping drunk drivers off the streets. 
Um, I asked for, for the cases that the DA wouldn't prosecute and they lacked a lot of evidence. It was, you know, there was no breathalyzer. There was no, um, it was, you know, it was outside the jurisdiction. Um, so it really kind of let us put a, um, uh, you know, a fine point on, on whether they were actually justifying for, for public safety or not. Uh, I'll kind of wrap up there. Um, there was another uh, big tentpole of this project, which was about in custody deaths. Uh, happy to take questions about that. Okay, I have a question, and that is uh, Monica Richardson just said that um, uh, her her Pulitzer proves the uh, the need for local journalism. And I wonder now, the New York Times is a big uh, has a big newsroom, a lot of resources. Is what you did can that be uh, duplicated at a at a smaller news organization? Looking nationally, probably not, but smaller news organizations can for sure look at, you know, their communities and their states, you know, it just is about deciding that this is a priority and putting in the effort. But, you know, um, the, to, to her point, like, I think that local journalism is, the, and what's happened to a lot of newspapers is one of the biggest crises facing our country. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, 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 Richard, could I just, please do just hop in and say one thing, I think what Kim said is right on one level, but I think there are lots of other models where you see partnerships. Certainly, ProPublica has done that a lot. Uh, a Marshall Project, you know, worked last year, won a Pulitzer for for uh, what was going on around the country with canine uh, use of canine police dogs, and that was a partnership with uh, a number of local um, uh, news organizations. So there are lots of models for it, and I know others are experimenting with those models too. For sure. And that's, I guess, what Dean is going to be working on in his uh, quote unquote retirement from being the editor. Um, but yeah, I think that those partnerships are great because you're lifting up, you're lifting up all local journalists when you're partnering up with a, a place like um, ProPublica and the reporting expertise they have there. Very good. Okay, time for one question. I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, um, I wanted to know, um, if there's been any other, any national coverage, sort of like as a follow-up to your um, series, because, um, you know, there are laws proposed to limit the number, the number of stops, police stops and interactions between um, black motorists that turn into major confrontations and, and uh, shootings and that sort of thing. Um, the, the one that comes to mind is Virginia, just because I read about it, they proposed it. And then uh, I was just looking it up. The state house is like, no, 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 we got to take it back because it's public safety. So has there been a follow-up on um, legislate, state legislatures trying to outlaw certain traffic stops? minor traffic stops because for example in virginia smell of marijuana right and like you'll see stops where the officer is standing on the street or in a, a car that's following and says they smell marijuana which seems like a neat trick um so we did a story in april that basically looked at um all the different laws that were being proposed in the legislation and the pushback from police unions I will drop that into the chat once once this uh, part of the conversation is done, um, and you know we're we're continuing to monitor it. But I think that like there's a real issue on the federal level with uh, taking on this issue and and trying to pass the George Floyd Act because there's been this sense that a rise in violent crime is somehow incompatible with the idea of police reform, right? Um, and as this, these fears over a rise in violent crime and this idea that like, oh, do we have enough police? It feels like that has almost become like a pendulum swinging in the other direction from the idea of national police reform, which was so at the forefront back in you know, the summer of 2020. Okay, thank you, thank you. I see Daryl Fears is here from the Washington Post. Daryl, uh, the Washington Post was a, was a finalist in this category for uh, uh, something that Daryl worked on involving environmental racism. So, Daryl, if you just want to, if you just have a few seconds to tell us about uh, uh, what you found and what are the lessons for other people, other news organizations. Uh, yeah, you know our. Uh, 
stories. Um, well, first of all, let me say just congratulations to all the winners because I'm a finalist and I'm here to hear them, you know, especially Corey. Corey reported from my hometown, St. Petersburg, and I can't wait for that. Uh, but uh, we, um, so I can't breathe, which were the last words of uh, two people who were killed by police, had an echo to us. And uh, we wanted to explore, you know, how that sort of had this eerie link to environmental racism and environmental justice. And so we set out to tell uh, a group of stories um, uh, about uh, these issues of freeways and uh, concrete batch facilities, um, uh, coal-fired power plants being located uh, in and around black, brown, and uh, native communities. And what we found was a link to redlining and government planners targeting these areas to uh, cite them. And uh, you know, I, I won't belabor this, but uh, I remember one story about the South Carolina freeways. Uh, we mentioned uh, Minneapolis where a freeway ran through uh, certain communities and uh, one person uh, was quoted saying, there aren't many black communities in Minnesota, but the freeways found them. Mm. And, and that to me uh, was the gist of, in, uh, of, of this type of coverage. Uh, some people have suggested that um, the Washington Post is fairly uh, uh, rich with resources and that uh, some people can't cover these issues on a national scale as we did. Uh, but I believe that environmental racism is local and uh, you can tell a number of stories just on a local level um, in uh, just one place. Uh, in St. Petersburg, again, my hometown, for example, uh, the planning for a freeway eliminated 10 churches and uh, black churches um, and the building of uh, that Thunderdome that the uh, Tampa Bay Rays play in uh, took away uh, a couple of graveyards, black graveyards. Mm -hmm. So that, um, uh, that is uh, what we did. And uh, thank you, Rich, for giving me a second to uh, talk about it. Thank you, Daryl. Well, you gave a good segue to uh, Corey Johnson, <laughs> who, who uh, did some, some uh, he and his team did a, some great local reporting at the uh, Tampa Bay Times. And let me find that citation. Uh, that is an in, uh, investigative reporting, uh, which as he pointed out, uh, uh, is not the most diverse area of, uh, of uh, journalism. Uh, so it was the, this, this award went to Corey Johnson, Rebecca Willington and Eli Murray of the Tampa Bay Times for a compelling expose of highly toxic hazards inside Florida's only battery recycling plant that forced the implementation of safety measures to adequately protect workers and nearby residents. And the Pulitzer was not the only award this year that that series got. So uh, Corey, uh, let's uh, tell us about uh, what you found uh, we, you've, you've gone through, you've told us about that before, but also what are the lessons for other journalists uh, who want to uh, be effective in their craft? Wonderful, wonderful. That's a really, 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 really good question. So um, incredibly proud and humbled for, uh, to win the Pulitzer uh, for a local story. Um, it's very, very difficult as those things go because you're up against the best of the best uh, at the New York Times and the Washington Post and ProPublica, Wall Street, you name them. Um, and those papers have more resources, uh, better talent, uh, more seasoned talent. I ain't gonna say better, just more seasoned, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and you just never know what people are looking at. I mean, I I've been blessed enough to uh, judge some contests and a, a lot of these contests oftentimes come down to you know who's in that room as Kevin mentioned and what they're looking at and what's important to them and what isn't important to them um, and so to think that this story uh, could be seen and uh, appreciated by so many different people um, is tremendously humbling I have to say it it it, it, it really drives home the whole point of having different people doing this work, but in a different kind of way. Um, the, 
this story is based on a personal experience. My family, particularly my mom's side of the family, they're all from Flint, Michigan. And as a child, I distinctly remember going to Flint every summer and drinking that water and it tasting like the nastiest thing you'd ever wanna, wanna put your lips on. And fast forward to the crisis in Flint that you know, became apparent to the, to the nation around uh, 2016. I was watching those stories and that was my first introduction into lead. And I started to read the stories about what lead can do to children and how toxic it is and how it can attack the brain and uh, essentially it, uh, attack the centers of the brain that deal with IQ and impulse control and violence. And, you know, I had to put my tinfoil kufi on a bit and start wondering how widely is lead uh, affecting Black communities and poor communities? And, you know, what could be happening? Like, could our, could our communities be in being undermined quietly, silently by this chemical, by this element, right? And so, when I moved to Tampa, I wanted to, I was curious about that. Tampa had all these signs. It had tremendously old buildings. Uh, there was no coverage of it. So I started asking questions to the local schools and it uh, resulted in stories that showed that there was a huge lead problem in the schools. And as things would happen, as the community started to see those stories, a confidential source inside the health department reached out and handed me this report. It was a 160 some page report. And there was two pages in there on lead poisoning. And it showed two things. One, that the county that we lived in, Hillsborough County, led the entire state of Florida in lead poisoning cases. There were more adults being poisoned here than anywhere else. And that was an aha, curious moment. The other thing it mentioned was that there was a battery recycler that was critical and it didn't name the battery recycler. So now I'm trying to figure out who is this battery recycler and why are so many people getting poisoned here? And that led to piecing it together and this plant quickly emerged. Uh, and once we discovered once I discovered that the plant was the last lead smelter left in Florida, and it was in our backyards, it, it, it was actually, it felt like a, a moment of shame. Like, how come we hadn't covered this thing before? What's going on over there? And so as I started to knock on doors uh, and I'm asking people, you know, what's going on with this plant? That's when we begin to hear that there was all these folks that were falling out from heart attacks and strokes and some of their babies were getting messed up. Uh, and so then the challenge was, and this, is, this is feeds into your question about how does the forward spin or how this could benefit other journalists. How do you get into a private company when the usual tools of Freedom of Information, freedom of information at request or looking at the government records those are the usual tools that investigative reporters rely on to get inside restricted places. But it wasn't, it wasn't much of that at all. We filed our FOIAs with the government and God, I tell you, they fought us for well over a year and gave us little to nothing that was usable. So how do you get in? The blessing was we read every rule there was about the, how a company uh, that handles these dangerous materials are supposed to conduct themselves. And it turns out that the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration gives workers a, almost a, a private Freedom of Information Act request, request privilege, where the workers themselves can get access to this confidential information around the pollution testing of a company, all the medical testing that companies are required to do to ensure that workers are not getting injured, they can get access to all of this. And so once we saw that, we started to reach out to a few people. 
Uh, this power goes for current employees as well as former employees. And the companies have to keep this record, these records for 40 years after someone leaves the plant. And so we started to reach out. Now I have to say this real quickly, you know, I'm black, as you probably noticed, uh, a lot of the, the folk over at this plant also black. So I would have thought that I would have just been able to show up, you know, with some ribs and, and, and pull out my soul brother number five card and, and we would get this thing on and popping. It didn't work like that. Not at all. In fact, I've been telling, I've told other folks that one of the biggest hurdles was having to get over the fear as well as the cultural mistrust. Uh, what's not widely talked about outside of Black reality is that Black communities oftentimes are very suspicious of Black professionals for good reasons, because there's so much bad history of white institutions using Black professionals to get in there and, and to do the community in. Um, and so, you know, I, my biggest challenge was trying to convince Black folks that I was not the FBI. And they kept saying, man, you the FBI, man, I don't fool with you. And I'm like, hey, man, I'm not the FBI. I'm a journalist with the Tampa Bay Times newspaper. And they'd be like, same difference, you know. <laughs> and so uh, on top of that, the real deal was that this company had a very sophisticated entrance surveillance system. There were cameras over, over every inch of that plant, inside, outside. The company employed private uh, detectives. Uh, they had even worker bees who were chatty and talk to folk and hear the gossip and then run back to the company. And so a lot of workers, this plant was their second chance in life. They had been either had low education or they had immigrated or they had spent some time in jail and now they're working a straight job and making the most money that they think they could possibly ever make because of their past. And so nobody wanted to blow that up for the little smiley face brother who they think is the FBI talking about, we need to get this out for the truth and justice of the people. You know, nobody was trying to hear that stuff at first. And it took one or two people getting their records and once they got the records, we could see the levels inside of that plant the, of, of lead and arsenic and cadmium, which are two cancer-causing substances, being hundreds of times higher than the federal lim limit. And in most cases, way higher than what their respirators could protect against, which means that they were just breathing this stuff in, into their bodies. Those records gave us an uh, opportunity to also see people getting tested, coming in healthy, and then immediately the lead stacking up into their blood. And then we could see them getting sick and going out to the hospitals and their health collapsing. And so for journalists like Daryl and others who really believe and, 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 and cover environmental uh, stories well, these, this rule, this OSHA authority is key to being able to crack the shell of secrecy and begin to, to really cover and connect the environmental uh, thing with the actual harm. I think that's, there are more companies than just this lead plant that fall up under these rules. And so, uh, uh, and, and lead is not the only other, this isn't the only substance that gives workers this right to get the record. So I would encourage anyone on this call and anybody who knows anyone on the call to, to, to spend some time with those OSHA rules. It's going to take some work now. Uh, and so the blessing that the newspaper did for us that many, that many news organizations don't do, they gave us the time to pull it together. And time is a big luxury item as we all know in newsrooms. And I have to say, I had to fight very hard <laughs> to get this time. Like it wasn't like the Tampa Bay Times bent over backwards and said, here's a 18 months, go get us a bullet. <laughs> um, but, but when, because of that, 
it allowed me to, as I began to get momentum and penetrate the workers, we, we, one thing that was common, whether you were black or white, this lead hit everybody. It hit people even at the highest levels of the plant. That's when we were able to get other breaks, hard drives, hard drives from executives, hard drives and other pieces to where not only do we could prove that people were poisoned, but we could show the way that the company hoodwinked the government in order to make their data and their, their behavior look like clean and well. And so the story not only exposed what this company was doing, but it also exposed how the government was just purely negligent and allowed it to happen. Um, and we even got folks inside of OSHA who leaked these things that allowed us to be able to nail OSHA and even the EPA uh, failures on this thing. So that's the broad sweeping breakdown of what the story did. Benjamin Crump and other civil rights attorneys, you know, came down almost immediately. They've signed up hundreds of workers. There's one lawsuit that's already in motion. There's others that's coming. Even Wall Street got in on the accountability. I started getting calls from investors that freaked me out because uh, uh, I, I didn't think they were investors at first and everybody wanted to know how many more stories I was going to do, how long is this going, uh, but the rating companies, uh, Moody's and Standard & Poor got involved and uh, the, uh, Moody's actually downgraded the company's credit as a result of looking mm. at uh, the stories and looking at the video. The other thing I'll say in closing if you haven't seen the story, definitely uh, take a look at some of the videos. Let me see if I can just show you this one video. Uh, don't I don't know if I can do it. And if I can't, then. But there's it doesn't look like I can, and I definitely don't waste waste your time. Well, maybe Benita can that help you? Can Can you put in the chat the link to that video? Thank you. Okay, very good. Okay, we have time for one question for uh, Corey. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry. Let me get that. Okay. Oh, you are you still, you still can get it done, huh? Let's see. Oh. oh, yeah. There's a link. No, I think that's the wrong link. Oh, why, okay. Why did that happen? But what's the question? Yes, who has a question for Corey? I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Hi, Corey. Um, uh, so I work at a local journalism um, institution in, in, um, in Washington, DC, and I'm currently trying to cover a story about medical failures in the community. Um, how would you suggest that a journalist like myself who works for an institution and, and a, covering a small community start um, to kind of like pull at the threads of a, a big story? Sure. So the I, I couldn't say I couldn't see who that was. Who was just speaking? Tamika. Tamika. Oh, Tamika. Okay, very good. Hi. Right. So the definition is key when you say medical failures. Uh, that could be very, very broad and, and encompassing. You might want to focus or pick out, and maybe you have, but I'm just saying, uh, yeah. uh, what type of failures and then uh, how you get to the people who have experienced it is going to be critical and what kind of paperwork they have that can spell that out would be critical. So as you meet the folks and they give you the necessary permissions to get the records, you want to start looking at those records and really interrogating them to see what they say and see what they don't say. And then you can begin to, to move backwards. You can all, you, you want to use an inside outside strategy of finding your people, looking at their records and then looking at what government requirements are what kind of government oversight, what government agency has a role, and then seeing what they did, didn't do. Uh, you want to, you know, the last little layer of that is eventually getting to the medical professionals who had some role in it. 
Um, it tends to be easier to do when you have permission from the family and you already have records in hand. If you go to them without any of that, you're going to get shut down for privacy reasons. And they want to hide behind privacy reasons. But uh, so, but you, but you also want to be ruthless about how you vet that information too from the family. Not ruthless in treating them, but you want to look at every factor that could have uh, resulted in the outcome that you're looking at. Because there were a lot of lead folks, for example, that also had bad diets. Uh, and so some of the, the stuff that they, they manifested could have been attributed to a bunch of other different things. And so we had to take, we, we were really judicious around what kind of examples we used because of that, uh, because we knew that whatever we published was going to be scrutinized by the mm. company's attorneys. Uh, and, and, and so we didn't want a case that could collapse on us simply because we hadn't factored in the other aspects that could have been going on with that individual. So I just suggest that, you know, you take, take these little things as you try to move into that story and I think it'll pay off for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Corey. All right, we wanna, uh, that's a good segue. We're talking about local uh, reporting. Uh, so we have with us Cecilia Reyes of the Chicago Tribune. She and Madison Hopkins of the Better Government Association uh, won the, uh, the lo in a local reporting category. And the judges said, for a piercing examination of the city's long history, this is Chicago, uh, of failed building and fire safety code enforcement, which let scofflaw landlords commit serious violations that resulted in dozens of unnecessary deaths. So Cecilia, um, please tell us more. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, really happy to be here, really honored. Um, yeah, certainly a lot of the things I was going to say Corey said in his great introduction. Um, yeah, local journalism is not just, you know, necessary, uh, but also, you know, yeah, facing, facing true problems of time, um, resources, and um, it's funny to, you know, be here and present this, um, this work after Kim because her methodology was very similar to ours. Um, so Madison Hopkins, again, at the Better Government Association and I, this was a partnership, we looked at every single fatal fire in the city of Chicago for six years. And out of those fires, we were primarily guided by the question, you know, did the city, was the city aware of any issues before the fires that played a role and led to people lose their lives in a, in a fire? Um, we were, you know, looking at this um, as analytically as we could after having started also from a very concrete example, similar to Corey's actually. So in Chicago, there was a terrible, fire in 2018 where 10 children died in Little Village um, in the city. It was mostly children. They were having a sleepover. Um, the coach house where they were at didn't have smoke detectors. As like people kept digging into what had happened there, how the fire started, where it may have started and how it spread, still unknown uh, by the way, like it became clear that the city was aware that the landlord of this property, for example, had had a bad record of providing um, these basic uh, safety standards for people. Um, and so going from that specific ex example, we broadened it out, um, looked at the six years, tried to get every piece of information that we could about the city's involvement with these properties, uh, with the landlords, um, and with tenants um, before, we, um, before we were able to determine that they had known and they hadn't essentially done their job to, to make sure that their own laws, their own safety standards were met. Um, you know, Richard, you mentioned um, that there were dozens of people who died. Um, and it was, I think in, in the bluntness of terms, um, 
because the city failed to follow through. Um, and the like the the most um, impact of this kind of failed system from start to finish, failed system of enforcement was with um, renters primarily, um, people of color, especially black residents, um, you know, people, old people, young people. Um, this story, you know, it was it was a housing story. Um, you've asked Richard, like, what other people can take away from it. Um, it's certainly, you know, we were thrilled to be in the uh, local reporting category, but it's certainly not just an issue in Chicago, um, you know, of re recent, um, recent fires that come to mind, the one in the Bronx uh, that took the lives of children as well, and there were many issues that were known. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a, it was a very intensive um, project. Um, Madison and I spent um, a good mm, more than a year <laughs> um, reporting this out, talking to talking to people, gathering the records, um, and yeah, I mean, I think what we were able to end up with at the end, similar to what Kim and Corey mentioned, was. Um, a clear indictment on um, the way that the city of Chicago enforces its own safety, like basic safety in people's homes. Um, and yeah, I mean, we were able to do that by being very thorough um, and by vetting, um, by vetting each one of those fires um, to make sure that, you know, we could, we could say things like, um, okay, well, city officials, you know, received a, received this complaint about no heat, and they received, you know, other complaints about no heat over a span of time where they can't even tell us whether they responded at all. And then, you know, that problem um, in turn was cited in a police report uh, that said, yeah, like, the tenants were trying to, like, keep warm in this apartment. Um, we also, you know, we're talking to uh, to the people as much as we could to find out, you know, had they try to contact the city, like what were the conditions in the property? Um, yeah, I mean, we it was very intensive. We went through very various rounds of vetting um, to make sure that we were both um, as fair as possible, as blunt as possible, um, and as airtight as possible. Um, yeah. The journalism. <laughs> That's the rules of the journalism. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I don't. I don't want to bore everybody. Um, yeah. I mean, very, very similar tenets to what what Kim mentioned, what Corey mentioned, um, and frankly, I mean, a story that we were both Madison and I were were very proud to work on, um, but uh, yeah, ultimately could have been done elsewhere. Um, you know. Is is still an issue? Um, yeah, I mean, housing, housing as a whole, um, and like attention to housing and and renters and what renters go through. Um, I think still very much, you know, a, a lot of stuff to cover there. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, before we go into our uh, editorial and commentary. Um, uh, categories. I just want to acknowledge uh, uh, the, uh, the the work of the Wall Street Journal in um, in, in covering the Tulsa situation. Uh, and Kimberly Johnson's here, and I want to just uh, give a shout out to her for leading that team. Is there anything uh, briefly you want to say, uh, Kim? Sure. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Um, we're pretty happy at the Journal that we're finalists. Um, you know, a little bit of the backstory. Uh, it was a team of uh, mostly Black journalists, um, Latino journalists and Asian journalists that came together um, on their own and said that we wanted to do a big project on race and business and looking at the wealth gap and institutionalized racism and what we we're trying to find a way to do that. And when you look back in history, and we were 
talking about this at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, actually, before COVID, um, the thing that was coming up was the 100 year, the centennial of the Tulsa race massacre. And you know this little known entity sort of in American history and, and black American history. And when we began looking at it and looking at this town, this neighborhood of Greenwood that they called Black Wall Street, um, it became really intriguing to us as business journalists. And we began looking at what was there, what was the economy like? And we made some pretty, one of the things I do want to point out is that we made some, some pretty foundational decisions early on. And we wanted to look at this from a, a business and economic perspective. Um, and we wanted to look beyond the, the massacre and beyond the violence. And you know, we had surmised that so many of stories that are told about race in America are told about black pain and suffering. Um, we wanted to, to look at that in a way that was different and through a different lens. And so when we started pulling records um, and we spent a lot of time looking at records, written records and talking to families, um, we, we found a lot of insurance records. We found you know, deeds and all of these things. And we found that people had insurance policies and they had claims that they had filed that were never paid out because their businesses were burned down by these white mobs. And we just start continue to trace all of the things that that had happened to them after the massacre and why they were not able to rebuild in certain cases. And you know, it's funny, we talk about environmental journalism. You know, one of the things is that in Greenwood, they ran a highway. If you go to this area of Tulsa now, there's a highway intersects it. And if you look really carefully, you have to sort of go up on the highway to find the plaque of where businesses in Old Greenwood once stood. So for us, it was really compelling to, to, under, to look at how things become institutionalized through a business and economics. Um, we looked through Chamber of Commerce records and how the Chamber of Commerce wanted to build a rare, railroad through the area and they really didn't want to rebuild it. So, when we start, we look today at environmental issues, home ownership issues, and all of these things that we are, we get to this inequality between blacks and whites. You know, what the Tulsa project showed us is that it was really important to sort of look back and try to look back even a hundred years and go from a hundred years to today to see all of these little things in between that have, basically denied Black people in America like their, their peace and their, you know, their ability to generate and to, to pass along wealth. And, and so we started to get at that in that project, and that's something that we're really proud about as business journalists. So thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, now, we, we have our editorial and commentary people. And of course, all, this, all these investigations and, and exposés that have been taking place uh, end up being commented on by the editorial page. Uh, but sometimes the editorial page itself does its own investigations. And we have some examples of that. And uh, Belinda Hennenberger is here with us. She, uh, while she was, uh, let me call her up, call her, her project up here. Um, woo -woo -woo -woo. Well, any, uh, oh yeah, here we are, okay. Uh, from the commentary, commentary uh, category, this is while Melinda was at the Kansas City Star. She was cited for persuasive columns demanding justice for alleged victims of a retired police detective accused of being a sexual predator. So Melinda, uh, please tell us more. Unmute, please, unmute. Unmute. So I, sorry about that. I wrote, I, I think it was 19 columns about this topic oh. last year, um, but I had written about it in previous years also. And the way I got started, what was already known was that a man named Lamont McIntyre had served 23 years in prison in Kansas for a double murder he had nothing to do with. Didn't know the people. He was a 17 year old kid at the time. 
no connection whatsoever, except that his mother had previously said she had been raped by a pol the police detective who arrested him like that and who showed all the uh, witnesses to this double murder pictures of Lamont and his brothers. And the mother, Rosie McIntyre, said that this happened because she was unwilling to ever see this police detective again. Well, so this all came out in the innocence hearing. He's let out of prison. I started, that, that preceded my time at the Star. He was let out of prison the same year I got there, which was 2017. And then I started writing about why isn't Kansas paying this man any uh, compensation for these many years he was in prison and wrong, he was wrongfully convicted. And uh, not just the detective, but the prosecutor absolutely knew that he was not guilty. Um, the witnesses were coerced. The witnesses were told that their children would be taken away from them if they didn't tell a lie on the stand to convict Lamont. So I started writing about where's the compensation. Kansas, you passed this law specifically to compensate Lamont, and yet where's the cash? Well, the cash was being held up because the police department and the DA and others in Kansas City, Kansas, um, we're still going around saying, well, Lamont is really guilty. Yeah, they let him out, but you know, that's not what happened. So I started to wonder, so he got his money finally. And I started thinking a lot about if this police detective did this, what else did he do? Um, no one had spoken to his other victims and getting them to talk to me, well, even finding them was kind of step by step, right? So I'd write one thing about what we did know, and then terrified women would come forward to me, come, not sure at first um, that they were willing to talk to me because they, I mean, they wanted to tell me their stories privately, but to be in the newspaper when they had been threatened with death when he had told them that, you know, their, their bodies would never be found or they'd be murdered and it would look like an accident. Um, so, you know, one of the women who called me, the, I'll never forget the first time we spoke, she was truly hyperventilating. I mean, to say these women were terrified and had never, most of them had never told their stories to loved ones even. So there were all these victims that, um, that I spoke to over the course of doing these columns. And then other things, and then slowly police uh, officers started to talk to me too. You know, it was a big deal when, I, I called this one, well, a victim had said that such and such a police officer had known all along about it because they had actually been friendly. So I just totally cold called him and he said, and he was a black officer and all of these victims are black. Um, and it's not just the police officer who did this, but the entire system that protected him and looked the other way for 35 years, he was with the department. So um, I call this black officer out of the blue and he's like, I can't handle it anymore. I can't keep quiet about it anymore. You know, this, this is just tearing me up. Yes, it's all true. Everybody knew it and so on. Um, so, you know, even now, nothing has happened to this man. Even now, he's walking around living on a public pension from his retirement. There is a federal grand jury looking into it at long last, but we'll, you know, most of the victims don't think anything will come of it. They can't even believe that, um, you know, there are people who believe what happened to them now, you know, and I don't want that to be the marker of success. 
This man and all who protected and enabled him should be in prison like the people he threw in prison who weren't guilty. Um, so I always tell people, if I had not reported this thing myself, I'm not sure I would believe that this could go on for decades and that all of officialdom would be content to look the other way. The FBI has been looking at this on and off since the 80s. <laughs> um, it's, it truly all defied belief. And, you know, my husband says, Melinda didn't so much pursue this story as she was possessed by it. And that is the truth. I mean, it was a very intensive, uh, emotional 24 seven kind of a, you know, there was rarely a night when I didn't have a late night phone call from a victim just beside herself. Mm -hmm. um, because now too, that the FBI is at least supposedly looking into this, Hearing this it, they're being followed. They have people oh, parked in about front of their homes. Very first um, they're still incredibly terrified with good reason. So I hear that. Okay, anybody got a question for Melinda? Yeah, I, I have one. Um, <laughs> Melinda, uh, this is, a, uh, I mean, we've heard these stories before, but this, uh, they, they continue to be chilling no matter what. Um, and this one you've told us uh, has, resonates that way for me, certainly. Uh, quite often, these cases only uh, receive the type of attention we would like to, uh, to happen when they're, uh, when they're amplified nationally because local governments, uh, the, uh, uh, for political uh, reasons, the predilection of the DA in this case, not to uh, pursue this, as you pointed out, uh, it, it seems like these things are locally, uh, confined locally, and therefore uh, nothing happens. What might happen, do you think, if um, this case was amplified nationally? And how might, uh, how might you go about doing that? Well, you know, Jay-Z's um, social justice arm, Rock Nation, got involved in this mm -hmm. and actually took out full page ads in the Washington Post to beg the DOJ to get involved. Um, and, you know, I was so naive. I was sure that after Joe Biden took office, the DOJ would send a team immediately and things would be so different. And um, he has not yet appointed a U.S. attorney for Kansas. So there's an acting and there's some thought that maybe that's why there hasn't been an indictment or there should really be a number of indictments. Um, but I think because there has been no legal conclusion, that's one reason there hasn't been more national attention to it. Um, CNN sent an investigative team uh, and maybe they're gonna do more, but I think they found it frustrating, uh, but it wasn't, you know, this is not a story you can do in a week. I mean, it took, it took me a long time to form true bonds with these people, right? So um, it's not a quickie and it's not, um, there aren't documents. Like, I mean, I call the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department where documents go to die. I mean, they barely dealt with me at all. Um, the, the, there are many women, six I've documented um, who disappeared, who were later found murdered, who were, um, you know, being sexually exploited by this police officer. So their family members want answers and have never gotten answers. Um, the FBI believes that he killed at least one of these women himself. So, you know, the fact that, that there has been no legal conclusion to it, that they have never shown up with the handcuffs, I think is why there has not been more of a national outcry. And as I wrote many times over, if women from Ward Parkway, which is kind of the fancy area in Kansas City, had disappeared and never been heard from again, and were all sexually connected, and that's a euphemism to this cop, do you think that Kansas City would just keep on walking and say, oh, well, that was a long time ago. Oh, well, the dude is old. 
you know, nobody knew, so sorry. No, they would not. But these women were drug addicts, working as prostitutes, no power. No, you know, when their families showed up worried out of their minds, nobody cared. And as you can tell, that makes me very upset. <laughs> if I could just say one other thing, this case has extraordinary resonance uh, to uh, one in Oklahoma uh, that we uh, involving a police officer. Uh, I'm only recalling uh, somewhat uh, the the uh, the details, and but I think folks remember um, he also preyed upon uh, black women, addicted women in some cases, uh, including a, a, a I think fairly elderly woman, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but anyway, that case did, of course, receive national attention, uh, and because the conclusions were a lot um, easier to. Um, uh, to determine. Uh, there was a court case, there was a uh, prosecution, and so on and so forth. But I'm also thinking with the presence of so many prominent journalists on this panel, uh, perhaps uh, uh, the, connect the dots can be connected uh, between uh, what you're doing um, and the uh, desire to um, uh, bring justice to, uh, uh, to this case, uh, perhaps in cooperation with some of these great folks on this panel. Well, the best thing about this award to me really is that um, it, I'm hoping it will bring some of that attention that you're talking about. Right, right, very good. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we wanna go to um, editorial writing itself. Uh, and we have here with us uh, uh, one of the editorial writing team from the, who, who was then at the Houston Chronicle uh, Luis Carrasco, uh, and uh, the award for editorial writing went to his team of uh, Lisa Falkenberg, Michael Lindenberger, Joe Holly, and himself for a campaign that, with original reporting, revealed voter suppression tactics, rejected the myth of widespread voter fraud, and argued for sensible voting reforms. So, Luis, please uh, tell us more. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, you know, congratulations, obviously, to to the winners and the finalists. And you know, there there are people on the board that aren't uh, included in the prize there at the Houston Chronicle, but everybody was really a part of you know through their support and everything, a part of allowing this project to to kind of materialize. Uh, and you know, to talk about the project, it, it really came about just you know good old fashioned outrage. Um, as, as the pandemic started to grow and Texas was really slow in helping people stay safe when they wanted to go vote. They, they really wanted to limit vote by mail. Uh, and so there were a number of, of court cases trying to go back and forth, trying to allow vote by mail so that you know, people wouldn't be risking their lives by going to the polls. Uh, and so I wrote a, a, a series of pieces on that um, which was really, uh, oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and then, you know, the election happened, the Trump's claims of a stolen election, we saw the consequences of that on January 6th. So we said, you know what, let's address kind of these claims head on. Um, after, after kind of the outrage of January 6th subsided, uh, you know, Texas was still on track through the state legislature to try and make it harder to vote, specifically targeting Harris County, uh, where Houston is, uh, and some of the measures that they implemented to, to help with the pandemic uh, and get people to make it easier to vote. And again, uh, you know, measures that uh, people of color took advantage of uh, at a larger rate than, than the white voters uh, there in Houston. Uh, and so, you know, it included 24-hour polling locations, uh, drive-through voting, you know, things that are very, <laughs> make perfect sense if you want to make it easier to vote. But for some reason, uh, the, the claim that they would make it uh, easier to commit fraud, that was the excuse to try and get, get rid of them, just make it harder to vote. Uh, so we looked at, uh, you know, the AG's own numbers. Uh, they were trumpeting all these cases of, of voter fraud. But once you looked you know, once you looked a little bit closer, it was just, you know, charges being filed, 
a lot of these cases, you know, they, they were dropped uh, or the people um, pleaded out. Um, we looked at the victims of these claims. You know, there's a famous case, Crystal Mason. Uh, she's a, a black uh, mother, grandmother in the Dallas area. She, she, she voted, she didn't know she couldn't vote. She had a, a felony conviction that still hadn't played out fully. She showed up at the voting place. Uh, she wasn't on the list. The system worked is what I'm trying to say on that. She wasn't on the list. And so somebody said, oh, uh, use a provisional ballot. Uh, and then of course her vote didn't count, but you know, in this fervor to find any sort of voter fraud, they targeted her. She said she didn't do anything wrong. She didn't want to, uh, plea to a lesser charge. So she was convicted and sentenced to five years for voter fraud. Uh, and, and fortunately, uh, this happened, uh, I think two weeks ago, the, the high court there in Texas uh, kicked it down to the lower courts to re-examine that verdict. But you know, she's been living in limbo for years where she's afraid she will go to federal prison, she will go to prison, sorry, uh, for just voting accidentally, not, not knowing there. So there are real victims to kind of this campaign of, of misinformation. Uh, we looked at all sides, the historical perspective, you know, not only the past 20 years where a certain part of the GOP has kind of been grooming voters to believe there is voter fraud, um, but, you know, going back to post reconstruction, you had groups in Texas that wanted to ensure that black and brown voters, you know, didn't go to the polls, so they, what issue did they raise as an excuse? Voter fraud. So, you know, the, the more things change, the more uh, they stay the same uh, in Texas. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it, it really was kind of a, a yeah, a, a deep look at uh, everything that just didn't make any sense and, and trying to, to push back against that. Um, we were successful in the sense that the Texas legislature did pass rest voting restrictions. And as they were debating it, uh, uh, another board member uh, and I went to the Capitol, you know, we printed out what had been written of the series until then. And then we like went to every office in that building, uh, uh, lawmakers offices and dropped off this series in just to, to call attention to it. You know, we, we got uh, mm. uh, some polite smiles from the Republican uh, offices, but uh, that was fine. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, uh, it, I feel that everybody was writing about it uh, at the time. I mean, every, everybody was saying it was trying to push back against the, the big lie that, that, you know, former President Trump was peddling. But I feel that, you know, we, we were at the right place. There was this overlap of, of local, what Texas was trying to do with with what was going on in, in the national stage. Uh, it was the right time for us, it was the right issue. You know, we had, uh, I think one of the pieces that was submitted as, as part of uh, the entry was just a, a blistering takedown that, that Lisa Falkenberg wrote of Ted Cruz, because he, he was, you know, um, at the forefront of a lot of this, Houston's own. So we, uh, we had something to say that was local and had obviously these huge national implications um, yeah, it, uh, and the writing, of course, I don't want to minimize that. I, th I think that uh, going back to that old fashioned outrage, there was no, you know, cold, dispassionate, uh, looking at the evidence kind of thing. It was using the evidence to just you know, get that anger at, at how this was just uh, unacceptable. Uh, and I mean, we're still dealing with, uh, and we'll be dealing with the consequences of this uh, going forward, so. I hear you. Okay, anybody got any questions for Lewis? Okay, well, thank you, thank you. All right, now we're gonna have move to our discussion portion and uh, our introductions of all those who are here. Uh, so let's uh, start with Karen Dunlap. Uh, Karen, can you introduce yourself? And if you Karen have Dunlap, topic. former president of the Porn Institute, now involved in community work in Nashville and family work in Tampa. All right. Uh, Darren Snyder. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Darren Snyder, freelance writer, often in the grill, HU, you know, former Gannetier, Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> Peace. 
All right, Greg Lee. Uh, unmute, unmute. Unmute, unmute, please. Oh, yeah, now we can hear you. You hear me now? Yes. Okay, <laughs> Greg Lee, uh, Senior System Managing Editor at the Boston Globe for Talent and Community. Um, and as well, former NABJ president. And congrats to all the Pulitzer finalists and winners. And um, also in the middle of uh, our 30th uh, Sports Journalism uh, Institute boot camp, where Michael Webbon is speaking to our students right now. <laughs> Our last one. So, congratulations once again on that. 30 years. Uh, Karen Berry. Hi, um, Karen Berry, um, copy chief for Anscape. And I just wanted to uh, give a couple of shout outs to all y'all that know me because it's too many names. <laughs> so, I'll just single out Kevin Merida, my former boss, <laughs> and um, uh, Tamika because she went to Howard too. Oh, okay. And Daryl and Darren. Uh, okay. All right. Roger Witherspoon. Unmute, please, Roger. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I spent some time in Texas on the editorial board of the Dallas Times Herald. Back when, um, <laughs> there weren't a whole lot of black folks around. Uh, it's good to see all of you here. It's good to see black editors and, and uh, editorial writers and some fine work. Thanks for putting this together, Richard. Thank you, that would be your welcome and thank you. Uh, John Watson. Hi, John Watson, I'm journalism John professor, professor at American at University in Washington, D.C. And I'd like to point out that eight of my current master's degree program students were part of the Pulitzer Prize winning time, led by a faculty member, John Sullivan, and a photographer also in the School of Communication. So congratulations to all the recipients of the, war, of the awards. I know it was a great deal of hard work and great for the country and the planet. You're here, you're here, here. Okay, Kevin, do you wanna add anything to what you've already said? Yeah, look, I, I first just, Congratulations to all the winners and the finalists and just listening to and talk about the work and, you know, and, and always to you, Richard, just as a convener, you know, of really enlightening discussions. I mean, I'm glad that Marjorie is on here as a new administrator because part of what I know she wants to do, um, and we want to do as a board is to, to really, you know, extend the to demystify the the Pulitzer Prizes, but also to to use the board and and the Pulitzer as a catalyst for inspiring other work. I mean, I look at it like you know, it's always a big moment, you know, to win a Pulitzer Prize or to be a finalist, and you get a lot of celebrating in newsrooms and and among uh, that collective. But we also know that you know that's really just an emblem because there's so much work that's being done that may not want to pull a surprise, right? We know all of that happens, right? And so it's really just a callus to celebrate the work, call attention to it, to share best practices and uh, to think about how do we honor our craft and, and, really, and really make it more important in the public mind what journalism can do, you know? And so, um, you know, this year, I just think about some of the things, I mean, I've already said that it was, uh, the most diverse pool of juries, you know, we always are, are um, always thinking about how do we expand the work and think about what gets honored, you know, audio reporting, you know, is, is one of the newer categories. And as we know, it's the fastest growing, you know, form of, of storytelling. And so we're constantly thinking about that um, was happy, um, you know, this year, for instance, in, in, uh, in, in audio um, uh, reporting um, for Turo one, um, mm -hmm. and, and for a uh, and uh, I don't have the citation in front of me, but but um, Maria Hinojosa, and uh, it's about a, a story of a an incarcerated gentleman, and and also 
one of the newer categories. I know cartooning has been a, a, a discussion uh, a lot, and we've expanded that, you know, to illustrated reporting and commentary, and and a, a, a group from Insider One, you know, um, uh, about the 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 um, one woman's experience of, of of Chinese persecution of the Uyghur um, people, and so. You know, you're really trying to just extend, like, how do we think about our work, which is what we're all doing in newsrooms anyway. And so, um, I hope that the the prizes can be a callus for it. There's, you know, it's, you know, some of us have been on juries. Um, you know, and this is only my second year being on the board, so uh, I'm still learning, learning how to read. You know, get my cadence down. There's a lot to read, um, but it's really, it, it's really an invigorating process. Um, because the work comes to us as finalists, um, and and we have discussions. You know, it's it's as simple as that. And they're always thoughtful discussions. Um, you know, you get you the work comes. You go category by category. Someone usually leads off the discussion, and then people jump in um, with their thoughts, and and then we vote. And it's really probably a lot of the same kind of discussions that go in newsrooms when you're thinking about projects, when you're trying to form what the work is, you know, those same kind of discussions. Well, how do we do it? You know, what do we think about? And so it's really, it's really enlightening. Um, you know, if I, if I could take that privilege is just to pass the mic quickly, if, if, if it's all right, Richard, to Marjorie, because she's a new administrator. And I know yes. some of what she wants to do is to, to go to places. I mean, I would love to see this collection, you know, in, in lots of forms around the country, because it would really help us, uh, you know, just as a democracy, right, to hear people talking about their work. It was really in, inspiring. Um, you know, just a couple of other points, because Corey said something earlier when he was talking about, uh, and there's a lot been said about local reporting, but, you know, two of the, um, two of the Pulitzer finalists for investigative were local uh, news organization. Tampa Bay has done consistently great work. The uh, Star Tribune was one of those. Um, you know, Melinda Henneberger, the finest, not, the, not to call her out, but she's been the finest four straight times, you know, which, which says something about the consistency of work, of, of, of work out of what she was doing in Kansas City. And so I think there's a lot of great work that's been doing locally. I don't want to underestimate that. And, and people kind of miss that. Note, because um, when you're looking at the work, um, and, and certainly the, the New York Times and the big places have lots of resources to throw at big, big topics. And, and that's important too for us, right? But there's so much great work going on everywhere, including some of the new startup places, you know? Um, and I was part of that Anscape, which was before the undefeated and uh, Soraya McDonald was a finalist uh, for Pulitzer uh, before I got on the board for criticism. And so there's a lot of great work you see, and and it and I think it's it's inspiring to um, you know, to think about all of the the new places that are really being their entrance to journalism. Um, I don't know, Marjorie. I'm just if you want to say anything about us. Sure. Um, I want to say first of all, thank you for uh, Richard for convening this and for um, inviting me to listen in because, as Kevin said. It's some of what I hope to be doing. Um, you know, I just took over this job a little more than a month ago. And I think that the Pulitzer brand uh, and the Pulitzer winners can hopefully uh, be much more active in, in uh, a couple of areas, one that are overlapping. Uh, it, showing um, over and over and over again, Americans why journalism is a key to democracy. And that's one of the reasons that I was so happy to see so many local winners because uh, journalism is a key part of the democratic process, which is under threat everywhere, including the United States. And uh, I think that one thing that is really misunderstood across the country is uh, what is journalism? What is deeply reported journalism and how is it done? And uh, these are the people who are, you know, doing some, some of the best work, but not all of the best work in the country. And I think if we could find ways to get into communities 
uh, they either are news deserts or they're very, very skeptical of journalists and journalism and what we do and view us as the, the enemy or the man or whatever and, and try to break down some of those barriers. So I was really interested to see this format and see people talking to each other and what you all have to say. And um, I also welcome any ideas you might have on where we could you know, take the show on the road and get into places that are maybe open to hearing from us and what we do and what you do. So anyway, thank you. And I look forward to talking uh, to all of you more. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Um, all right, Ti Hua, did I get, get the spell, the, the pronunciation? Pronunciation's fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, uh, I'm Tiwa Chang. I'm a freelance climate change investigative reporter. Uh, I was a broadcast journalist for a long time and, uh, you know, great to be here. And I certainly learned a lot listening to everybody. And I was just thinking back several decades ago, I attended, uh, I was nominated for an Emmy. And I just happened to note that, uh, in the categories where you did not see the face of the reporter, all the winners were diverse. Diversity, both in terms of race and gender. And in the categories where you saw the face of the reporter, they were all white males. And I, and I remember thinking that that year, uh, I did finally that night win a, an Emmy after nine nominations. I've won five since then. But I think the whole idea of diversity in the judging is critically important. Um, I know that uh, uh, a couple of times, in, certainly in my career, you know, I've won a Peabody, a Morrow, a bunch of Emmys, a lot of different awards, AP, UPI. I've won about, well, several dozen, but I never felt I got support from the companies. Uh, I remember when I won the Peabody, nobody celebrated. I didn't get any champagne. I didn't, nobody said anything to me. In fact, I found it was very interesting that most of the mid-level white male managers who were mediocre, not all of them, some of them were my biggest supporters, but the mediocre ones started targeting me after I won the Peabody, treating me as if I was a rookie reporter and doing everything they could to convince me not to do stories. Uh, one manager, in fact, came up to me uh, and tried to get me to stop doing a story on Rudy Giuliani. Uh, Way back when in 1999, I found out that Rudy Giuliani put the Office of Emergency Management at the Seven World Trade Center because he got a $50,000 campaign contribution from the owner of the building, Larry Silverstein. Mm. And then if people recall on 9-11, when he tried to go to the OEM center, he almost got killed. So, and when I did that story, one of the managers actually approached me and said to me, um, you know, you've been working on this story for a long time. And you've gotten nowhere. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, because you're not giving me the time. I'm doing this all on my own time. <laughs> you know, maybe if you gave me a little more time. I was single at the time. So I spent all, all day and night basically working. And I would do my regular story that I got signed, whatever death and destruction I did in local TV for WNBC at the time. But then I would go and do more investigative work on my own. And I just think back on it now, and, and honestly, I think back that uh, over my career, because you had asked, uh, Richard, you had mentioned that you might ask what, it, what it's been like for my journalism career. And I think back on it, and I always felt like I had to work harder than everybody else because uh, I always felt as an Asian male on TV, I was the bottom of the ladder. Nobody wanted to hire me. And then I had to work harder, be better, and I had to be more aggressive or allow my aggressive self to come out. And then I would be called difficult. I got laid off a lot. And, uh, and when I would win awards, it was almost as if people were, uh, most of the people were sort of angry that I won an award. Like this pain in the butt won an award. This guy who considers himself Mr. Journalism won an award. And two people who helped destroy my career at CBS Network News, when I was a freelance correspondent in 2015, uh, the David Friend and uh, Peter Dunn, uh, who called up to the network and said, you shouldn't hire this guy. He's a pain in the butt. And he thinks he's Mr. Journalism. Uh, they subsequently got exposed as being bigoted 
and and um, you know because they were anti-gay and anti-black, and I and that um, you know there was an investigation by CBS and I was contacted by CBS, gave them documentation, and they never I never heard back from them, and they never contacted the people uh, who. Had Oops, we lost you. We lost you. I'm mute. Okay. Okay, we can't hear you. Okay, well, we'll move to the next person, but meanwhile, you can put your, your remaining remarks in the chat. Uh, Benita Bing. Good afternoon, everyone. Congratulations to the folks that won. This was a very enlightening uh, meeting this evening. Uh, I'm Benita Bing, president of the Exposure Group, African American Photographers Association, located here in Washington, D.C., and also the owner of the Talbert and Bing Studios, located in the Brooklyn, northeast section of Washington, D.C., and uh, the producer of uh, the Zoom meeting. Yes, the most important part. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for your cooperation. <laughs> Thanks, Benita. All right, Daryl Fears. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, I, I just wanted to sort of say that what T, I'm gonna, I'm gonna massacre your name, but, but what T Hua was saying uh, resonated deeply with me. Um, I think that were it not for uh, the racial reckoning and the elevation of, um, uh, certain people, to, uh, Chris O. Thompson in particular, to uh, managing editor at the Washington Post, uh, my work would not have been um, nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, and so representation matters. Uh, Kevin Merida is a mentor and a friend, and I'm very gratified to see him uh, sitting on the Pulitzer board. Um, and so we need, um, uh, this representation is crucial. Uh, and as I sit here and I look at all of these faces and I reflect back on my entry into journalism, I can never forget uh, this question uh, by white reporters, are you a journalist or are you a black journalist? As if they had no agency, as if their color did not matter. And what they were asking is, are you a black journalist or are you a white journalist? Yeah. And, and we need to understand that question uh, and that uh, these, uh, I, I don't wanna say these people because that doesn't sound appropriate, but no one lords over what good journalism is, no group. And so I'm looking at this and I'm looking at the deep, uh, journalism that this group has done. And I'm like, how do we pay this forward? How do we keep this going? So um, I don't know if you called on me to say all of that, but I just wanted to get that out. Thank you. And Neil, why don't you just repeat what you put in the chat about, <laughs> about that question? Oh, are you a journalist or are you a black journalist? Well, I got that in the job interview in 1984. Four, I believe, when I was interviewing for a job there. And as you all know, this was during the time of, of the coverage of the Jesse Jackson campaign when Milton Coleman got challenged with this question. Um, what was the news organization? New York Times. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Uh, we're going to go to Philip Martin. Philip Martin. Uh, unmute. Hey, it's it. uh, thanks, Richard. Uh, it's great seeing uh, everyone, uh, uh, as Kevin said, all these faces uh, and all these, uh, all this experience, uh, institutional, institutionalized memory. I love it uh, and much appreciate it. Um, I'm a senior investigative reporter, GBH News Center for Investigative Reporting here in, in Boston. I'm in Cambridge at the moment. That's my home. And uh, it's an opportunity to say uh, hi to Daryl and congratulations. He's an incoming Neiman fellow. Ah. Uh, so he'll be uh, down the street here, about uh, half a mile away from me. 
Uh, that could Looking be for a meal. <laughs> you got it, Chief. Um, I am uh, probing uh, these days um, the convergence of conservative mainstream uh, uh, politics and activity uh, uh, and ex the, that of the extreme right, um, which is uh, proliferating here in the Northeast. Um, there's a symbiosis of, um, of extreme right um, uh, thoughts, activities, uh, and the illiberalism uh, that, that we're hearing from politicians. Uh, not just Marjorie Taylor Greene, but um, uh, much of the Republican Party uh, has endorsed a, um, a frame uh, that all of us should be concerned about uh, because it's uh, not only a threat to our democracy, but to, um, uh, and part of that democracy, of course, is uh, free press. Um, so that's what I'm probing these days, investigatively. Um, and uh, 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 I'll be digging deeper uh, this hasn't been announced yet, but I can announce it here. Uh, uh, I'll be digging deeper as a Shorenstein fellow at Harvard uh, this coming. Thank you. This coming um, uh, September, uh, and uh, so that's that's where I am right now. And uh, absolutely ecstatic to see uh, you folks and to hear how these stories uh, have originated. The provenance of uh, of uh, stories of, uh, from Kansas to L.A. to Tampa uh, to New York and across the country, uh, it, uh, it 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 encourages me uh, and and gives me a lot of uh, a lot of hope, in especially in the context of this uh, of this illiberal moment uh, that we're uh, that we're dealing with. Well, all right, thank you, for, thank you for uh, congratulations. Thank you, thank you, Beatrice McBride. Hi, good afternoon. I really appreciate this information, just awesome. I'm a freelance photojournalist based in Dallas, and I'm a member of the Exposure Group, and I'm also the director of photography for the Denton Black Film Festival, which Neil and I both work on. So I really, really appreciate all this great information. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Beatrice. Uh, Lewis, uh, you want to tell us more? You're no longer in Houston, for one thing. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Now in, in at the Seattle Times now, um, <laughs> and getting getting used to Seattle very different than Houston. <laughs> yes, <it is>. Understatement. <laughs> understatement. Yes, I, I feel I I I make the joke that uh, I'm moving to the right here, which is weird. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, man. Uh, Neil Foot, your turn. Sure thing. Great to uh, see everyone. Thanks for the wonderful conversation. Uh, you know, this is what journalism's, you know, round tables do. No one is doing this. Uh, I'm biased. I've been working with Richard for, you know, as many of us for, for dozens and dozens of Neil years. Neil is the chairman of our board, journalism. Well, absolutely. Well, you know, thanks to the great work of Richard and so many others who helped kind of come up with these ideas. So thank you all for you know, what always impresses me is the two, two and a half hours folks spend to engage in these conversations uh, with, with such a, a wide range of ideas, conversations, and hopefully inspiration to all of us. Uh, I'm in the midst of uh, putting together our 18th Mayborn Literary Nonfiction Conference that will be in Dallas, uh, October 28th, 29th. So got lots of great ideas from this panel for potential panelists. And certainly continue to support Richard in whatever way you can, certainly with ideas, certainly with financial support. I have to say that I'm chair of the board. Uh, we wanna see this go well into uh, generations beyond those of us who have, uh, have put blood, sweat and tears into uh, making sure diversity is an integral part of everything we do. So thanks Richard for all you do. And thank you all for being part of this conversation. And thank congratulations you. to the Pulitzer Prize winners. Thank you. And that was a, a nice segue for me to, to say that we still have an opening for assistant editor of journalism. Um, so uh, anybody who's interested, just uh, let me know. Uh, Sharon Farmer. <laughs> we can't hear you, Sharon. Here we go. Ha ha! Yes. I recently got an award from my Anacostia High School in Southeast. 
Yeah. I'm a member of the Hall of Fame. Yes. So yes. don't say high school is not a prelude to good things to come. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Uh, unmute, please. Unmute. Who did you call on, Richard? Uh, Claudette James. Oh, hi. Um, good afternoon. Um, as you know, journalism redefines itself. Um, I want to thank all of the Pulitzer winners and the finalists um, for providing such insight and details today. Um, I totally applaud this passion for truth um, because we have seen so much other information out there, but um, I am truly inspired by today's presentation. And thanks to everyone um, for the commitment and hard work. Um, I am Claudette James. I'm founder of Truth in Education and Journalism, which is basically a nonprofit supporting initiatives that advocate for truth. Um, we have endowments and scholarships. Uh, we work in the area of diversity and inclusion in the workforce, and also elevating community literacy. Re recently launched um, the Philadelphia Reading Corner. And I will definitely be sharing more information about that um, in, in months to come. So again, thanks to all. And I'm looking forward to seeing more information, more stories focusing on truth also in education. So we had some great areas today, but we need to also um, investigate more into the education system so that we may elevate all of our communities, all of our children and all of our families. Prince, thanks again. And congratulations again to uh, Daryl Burnett who was just uh, moved from Education Week to the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, Fergus Shiel. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, many congratulations to all the winners uh, and finalists uh, for your stories and for this vital reminder of how important airtight, blunt and diverse journalism is. I'm the managing editor of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists and I'm uh, delighted to be here today. All right, thank you, Fergus. Sandra Hominick. Are you still there? We don't see you, but we see your name. Okay, she must have stepped away. Rochelle Riley. Actually, I'm sorry. I did step away, uh, wrapped okay. up, and I put some comments in the chat. I really wanted to, to stress um, some points that were made that uh, a lot of what can be done on a local level involves uh, partnerships and collaboration, and, and that's one project I'm working on right now with the Chronicle of Philanthropy. Uh, just uh, selected in March for local organizations who uh, we're working with, who are fellows, as we tell the importance um, and the impact of uh, nonprofits, charities. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge business. And, and so we want to shine the light on that and hold them accountable. So that's our effort in doing that. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Sandra. Rochelle Riley. Hello, everyone, and Richard, thank you again so much for doing this. I'm Rochelle Riley. I'm Director of Arts and Culture for the City of Detroit, former longtime columnist at the Detroit Free Press and a member of the Journalism's Board. I, I really think, and I want to say this to Kevin Merida and all of the Pulitzer team, I don't know if Ms. Miller's still on, but we need to have this kind of forum televised at, when the Pulitzers are announced every April so people can hear about these stories, hear the difference that they make, and get a sense of how journalism still works. I, I hope journalism doesn't reinvent itself because all journalism is local. And I want even those papers and media outlets who have the wherewithal to do the big stories, remember that they affect people in the small places. Um, I, I can tell you as Mr. Chang spoke about the horrendous you know, treatment that he got while he was successful, I can tell him that he recounted the similar experience of lots of black reporters, but also women reporters. There, there were several times where I did amazing work, according to other folks, and was not nominated for lack of a penis. And I always thought about how different life would be if that were not happening. Um, I'll, I'll give you two examples. Back when we were covering Kwame Kilpatrick in the 1980s, and I managed to be in the city council chambers where they didn't allow reporters, where he resigned and then took his resignation back. 
And that column resonated around the country. And the editor, uh, the, I'm sorry, the guy who was the managing editor said he wasn't going to be nominating that because I needed to find my own story. And that story belonged to the two white reporters who were doing that. And then I also did a second column where the <laughs> clerk the, the, who was responsible for elections sent out the ballots for the election with Kwame Kilpatrick's name already on them. These were absentee ballots. And when I, the editor found out I got that, he called me into a meeting with the city editor and asked if I would give that information to a white reporter who was mm -hmm. writing about it. And I said, well, what am I supposed to write? He said, well, you can write a column, but not say that you spoke with her. And I was the only person that this clerk spoke to and admitted that. And her response was, well, I went back and got them from people, so it doesn't count anymore. Um, and I refused to let that, let that editor put somebody else's name on that column. But those are the types of things that happened all the time. Is and that the editor still there? Oh, God, no. No. <laughs> and people don't know about this. It's the first time I've ever mentioned it. But I, I can tell you that there were times where there were uh, male columnists and male reporters who literally said, well, we can't put uh, two people from the same newspaper in a contest. So we have to put this other person. And it's the kind of stuff that is changing because we have really great editors that are rising to the top. And I'm hoping that the young reporters who we need to come back behind us will not have this kind of experience. Or if they do, they can let us know. Because if we give up journalism, we give up democracy. So I am so proud of all of the Pulitzer winners. Congratulations, all of the finalists, because that means your work was considered. And particularly my friend, Melinda Henneberger, who years ago, we started in the cop shop back in Dallas. And I knew she would always do great things. <laughs> So thank you, thank you, thank you for doing this. And yes, we need to have this conversation every year after the Pulitzers are announced so people can hear the backstory of every single one. Thank you. And, and Rochelle, thank you for saying no more about those days. <laughs> <laughs> not another word, not another word. <laughs> All right, Jill Dreyfus, before you leave, can you just tell us who you are and any I'm other a, observations? I'm a journalist of some 50 years in the business. A found co-founder of NABJ and spent most of my career in magazines, which doesn't count as much at NABJ as newspapers. But a couple of quick Pulitzer anecdotes, talking about reluctant bosses. I was uh, on a team at the, at, in the style section of the Post in the 70s, which I'd call an all-star team with Dorothy Gilliam as editor, Jackie Trescott, Holly West, and we decided to do a series of articles that were connected by the attempt to make Black people normal. In other words, they were not stories about pathology. They were about everyday life, like um, the, the diner, the Florida Avenue Grill, where, where civil rights leaders often met. And, and it was an attempt to give a picture of Black folks as normal people. And we brought it up to Ben Bradley for a consideration he said i'm going to nominate it but you're not going to win so that was encouraging a yeah. few years later i was up on a pulitzer i was a pulitzer juror when when janet cook's hoax came up and it was sent to our committee but i had heard and i wasn't the only one but several of us had heard from friends at the washington post that there were suspicions about that, those stories so i recommended that we not address it it was moved to another committee and granted the Pulitzer anyway. Okay, very good. We have a surprise. We have a surprise. And that is that we were just joined by Marcus Yam, who uh, is, uh, I don't know whether he's in Afghanistan at the moment, you, you can tell us, but he won the Pulitzer for breaking news photography, both for raw and urgent images of the US departure from Afghanistan that capture the human cost of the a historic change in the country. I mean, uh, yeah, in, in the country. And they since moved on to Ukraine where he's also produced some fantastic uh, photographs. So Marcus, congratulations and uh, uh, say hello to all of us and, 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 and some uh, tips about how you, uh, how you, how you uh, achieve these photographs that won such a claim. Where are you anyway, by the way? City. Uh, sorry, I joined so late. I had to do laundry. I haven't done it in a while, and I've been wearing the same clothes for about a couple of days. So I'm starting to, I think people are starting to notice in the subway. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, thanks for the, uh, thanks for giving me a shout well, out. First of all, where are you? you? 
New York, New York. Oh, you're in New York now. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. I'm in I'm in a, a friend's place in Flushing, Queens. Heart of it call I call it dumpling capital of the world. Um, and um, we just ready to launch to Ukraine here in a little bit. And you know, just excited to get back to work and you know, continue my life. <laughs> um, and uh, no, get thanks for the shout out. I appreciate it. Um, how well, I tell feel us, we've I, been all, all the winners we've asked them about that. I, I can't hear you. Sorry, oh, sorry. Richard, we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? I hear you now. Yeah, okay. yeah. My, I, my, all the all the winners have told us, uh, we asked them a question about uh, uh, what lessons they have for the rest of us so that we can do the outstanding kind of work that they did. So what is your response to that? What's the secret? Honestly, I, I've had some time to think about a lot of questions that people ask me, but I think one of the best kept secrets that I've had doing my job is I've got a good boss. <laughs> I've got a really, really good boss. And um, if I know, if I told the younger me, like, you know, if I if I had only one advice to tell the younger me, I'd say find find a good boss who's willing to be your mentor, who is going to help you grow up, and you know, watch your back and everything else and everything else. It doesn't matter if you're working for a community newspaper or anywhere. You know, it you'll grow and that's and you'll do meaningful work that way. And I think my boss at that you know at the time and and still is. Um, recognized that I needed to go into Afghanistan and when the country was falling I called an emergency meeting and uh, we don't have the resources to to be there all the time so we have to be selective about when we go in and I pleaded to them around like you know early August like we need to go we need to go and I think they were like well you know can we wait just a little bit more like you know we just want to September 11th is coming maybe they'll Maybe the country will, you know, maybe things will coincide then. And I said, it'll fall. And I think my boss recognized the urgency in my voice and said, just go. And I had 20 minutes to pack. And then I caught, you know, I caught just the last flight out of Lebanon and just got there in time and landed August 14th in the afternoon and, you know, hit the ground running. You're here. So, All right. Thank you, Marcus. Anybody got any questions for Marcus before we move on to the next person? Okay. All right. So we're good then. All right, Marcus, thanks again. Uh, did any, anybody in particular you wanted to mention, you mentioned all these bosses and people who, who uh, deserve shout outs, but we didn't get here any names except for one. Could I mention some, Richard? Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I did have some success in my career and I have to attribute that to people like Dennis Swanson, Paula Madison, and Diane Doctor. The uh, other people who were negative, I'm not going to mention, but those three individuals, you know, uh, a white male, a uh, African American female, and a uh, white female, they definitely helped my career. I probably wouldn't have had any time to do any work if I had not had that. So I should say something positive as well. Very good. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, let's get back to it with the rest of us, and I'm glad you're here with us, uh, uh, Marcus. Uh, Angela Dodson. Oh, oh, Richard, one more thing. I have to admit, I, I say boss, I say boss a lot, but I should name him. But his name is Calvin Hum. Yes, and he's okay. now the executive director of photography and um, he's, um, you know, look him up. He's, he's quite accomplished and he's uh, one of the best people I've ever had in my career. And I, you know, I feel a certain loyalty to him and, and, you know, I, my life has changed because of him. Here, here for Calvin. Okay. Uh, Angela Dotson. Thank you. Um, I am currently focused on being the uh, CEO of something we call Editors on Call, which is kind of a marriage broker for freelancers and clients who need them. My husband retired from the Philadelphia uh, Inquirer, uh, Media News, Philadelphia Media News as vice president and joined me in the company. One of our current projects is we act as co-managing editors of Marcom Weekly, uh, which is a startup that covers marketing, advertising, uh, PR, and media. Um, and we have a number of ghostwriting projects at the moment, one of which we're doing together and some we're doing separately. Um, I am the author of a book called Remember the Ladies Celebrating Those Who uh, Fought for Freedom at the Ballot Box. 
And uh, I spent most of my career in newspapers, as most of you know, including at the New York Times. And um, Richard forgot to mention that Melinda started a brand new job the day she got the Pulitzer. Um, and I've spent uh, some time in magazines, mostly as executive editor of Black Issues Book Review for some time, um, and a number of other other things in okay. the industry. All right, let's let's let's. All right, thank you very much, Angela. Lynn Adrian, board member. Yeah, I'm Lynn Adrian, one of the board members for Journalism. Uh, I am director of the DC Graduate Program in Broadcast and Digital Journalism for the Newhouse School at. Um, Syracuse University. I want to give a shout out to my classmate, uh, Kevin Merida, ah. from the day at, at Boston University. I also absolutely want to talk about the importance of having diversity and representation on the, on the boards and the juries for these awards. I spent seven years on the DuPont Columbia Award jury, and it is so vital to have people who can step up and talk about the type of work that has to be done in adverse circumstances to do quality work that's up for the awards. Because a lot of times people in the higher, uh, more recognized network television sphere will get recognized without people paying attention to the fact that how hard it is, just as someone has already talked about, for local television people on their own time to do the research, do the investigation, that is so vital to serving those local communities. So hopefully uh, Kevin's uh, appointment and other people will be following in our footsteps because if there's not representation, people of color, there's not gonna be diversity in the awards. Here, here. Okay, PJ Joshi. Uh, hi everyone, I'm uh, PJ Joshi actually, is that how you say it? That's okay. Sorry. No, no. Um, I uh, recently started a new job a few months ago at the Washington Post and now um, national editor for Weekend. Oh, uh, okay. Yes. I, Congratulations. Uh, thanks. And I recognize a lot of people from previous jobs and previous life. So um, hi, everyone. Um, it was just really great to um, hear from, from so many of the wonderful winners and the talented winners. And I think the future is in great hands with mentors like you. So. Got it, got it. Thank you. And congratulations again. Henry Farman. Hello, everyone from LA. Uh, thank you, Richard and Bonita. My third time here. Thanks for including me. What a what an inspiring conversation. I'm a retired uh, longtime copy editor, copy chief of the LA Times and still LA Times super fan. So I think Kevin had to up off, but I'm grateful to him. And Marcus, for, I just am excited every day to go get my paper off the doorstep. I still get the, the print edition. And, uh, lovely to see some talented alumni, Marjorie, Daryl, and I think PJ mentioned her past life, all former LA Times folks. Um, so I think of the LA Times often outnumbered, but never out hustled. It's a great, great institution for all the generations represented here. And, and uh, Marcus, um, please stay in LA. We, we, love, uh, we love having you. I love reading your stuff. Uh, uh, and seeing you seeing your work. Um, I should also mention I'm a former national officer and current LA officer, longtime officer of AJ. And what a thrill to see uh, my friend Tiwa here and a true AJ legend. Uh, we, a lot of us got AJ started in LA about four years ago. Tiwa was part of a really influential group in New York back in the day who got us going. And I think you formed the, maybe formed the Michigan chapter way back in the day too. So if you don't know Tiwa, uh, please Google him and follow him on Twitter and you'll see some great work. But, all right. Uh, and I'll see him uh, with, I hope, some of you in July in LA for our, our national conference for AJ. Right, very good. Thanks again, Richard. Thanks, Henry. Thanks, Henry. Jason Michelo Johnson. Uh, unmute. Hello, everybody. Unmute. Good seeing everyone. Uh, I'm formerly the um, journalism visiting professor at Savannah State University, just completed six years there. Whew. Mm. And uh, looking forward to the NABJ convention um, in Las Vegas, where I'll be the fish photographer going on 30 years now as a fish photographer for NABJ. And that's about it for me. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Right. Uh, Shirley Carswell. Shirley, are you still there? Yep, I'm here. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Shirley Carswell. I'm the uh, executive director of the Dow Jones News Fund. And I'm happy to report that we had one of our largest classes this year, 107 interns, largest in about a decade. 
um, also one of the most diverse. And they're also off training this week and next week to go to their internships. Um, I was for about 25 years at the Washington Post, also taught journalism at Howard University. And um, I'm happy to be here. This, this uh, discussion was amazing. And I really do think it's important that the public hears this. Um, here's how these stories come about because they don't trust uh, the media as somebody alluded to in their remarks. And I think if they hear the care, the, uh, the concern, the commitment that these journalists have, um, that it might make a difference and we might see some change in those, uh, those statistics about trust of the media. Thank you, Richard, for your work. And thanks, it's good to see all of you guys. Um, hope to see some of you in uh, LA and in Vegas. All right, thank you, Shirley. Uh, let's see, Kenneth, is that you, Ken Walker? Kenny Walker? She wants it. Is that the Kenneth on here? Okay, we, uh, we'll come back to Kenny. Okay, all right, Mary Curtis, Mary C. Curtis. Hi, everyone. Good to see so many familiar faces. Um, Mary C. Curtis, I am um, a columnist at Roll Call covering the intersection of politics, culture, and race, um, host of this Equal Time podcast, a contributor to NPR affiliate WFAE in Charlotte, three appearances this week talking about Buffalo, and also, as Philip mentioned, the, the uh, politicians who are leaning into great cons the great uh, replacement conspiracy. Uh, senior leader of the op-ed project. So congratulations to all the winners and the finalists. I, I also have to give a special shout out to Melinda Hennenberger with whom I've worked at four different outlets, mm. including a couple she hired me at. And um, <laughs> while, uh, because I've been in contact with her, uh, I also know that she like so many others uh, is, is happy at the award of course, but still very frustrated that the women have yet to receive justice. Mm, all right. Okay. Uh, iPhone two. Is that you, Gloria? Why am I not? Yes. Yes, Richard. Thank you. Uh, once again, congratulations to the Pulitzer Prize winners and their finalists, and to Hall of Famer Sharon Farmer. Richard, yes. thank yes. you once again. You never, never disappoint. Oh, I'm with, I, I was formerly with, uh, well, formerly with Pacifica WPFW Radio. Thanks again. Yes, they're in DC. Okay, thanks everybody. Did I miss anyone? Okay, good. All right, so uh, thanks everybody. Uh, there will be uh, copies of this chat room. Um, oh, there will be copies of the chat room uh, made available to everybody who's on the call. Uh, and a shout out to those on Facebook as well. Uh, our next meeting will be on June the 5th. And among, among, um, Presenters there will be the authors of this book, which was just released last week. They're now making their tour. Two Washington Post reporters, Robert Samuel and, and Tolu Olu, 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 I, I always get this wrong here. Olu and Ranipa, uh, both of the Washington Post. I think spent a lot of time. Oh, um, uh, okay. on this. It's just a girl. Like, I have two girls, and I but never heard about George Floyd, the person, and how he represents uh, uh, the trajectory of a lot of black men. So I, I will care we'll, them. I didn't tell, I didn't. hope to see you then. And in the meantime, uh, thanks to all and for an enlightening discussion. And hope to see most of you or a lot of you uh, next time around. Richard. Thanks again. I'm, Bye. I don't okay. know the way. Good night all. Well, good evening, I think, sir. Thank you, Richard. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. I appreciate it. Sorry I'm late. <laughs> All right, no question. You can watch the recording. We'll, we'll, we've recorded this. Okay, sounds good. Email, okay, uh, send me a copy. Um, I'll watch All it. All right, certainly will. And okay. thanks again for joining us. Hey, no problem. Thank you. Richard, get on.
Hi, Richard. I couldn't get on soon enough to say that. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> for oh, your, did I miss you when I went around? Yes, yes, oh, you did. But I couldn't right. get on soon enough. I mean, every time I tried to get on, I muted myself somehow. Oh, anyway, okay. Anyway, um, appreciate your work, hard work. It takes leadership, and you're 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 certainly providing that to us. And uh, all right. Yeah, yeah, that, it was a great session. Absolutely. Thank you, fantastic. Paul. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You take Good care until the next until yeah. next time. Bye bye. Until next time. Okay. Yes.